joy in our town. I have with me two very special people, Dina Martin Owens and Ron Kelly, and they are with Cry For Me No More. And uh, what, a, what a great association that you have. Uh, you are helping people deal with grief. Yes. Tell me about this association and tell me how it got started. Tell me what you do. Okay, sure, Terry. And thank you for having us here today. You're so very well. Uh, I am the vice president and co-founder of Cry For Me No More. And I started this journey after I lost both my children in a car accident in 2011. And that's when I was called to serve other bereaved parents and help them through the grief journey because it is such a difficult road. And uh, my business partner who lives in West Virginia, her and I created Cry For Me No More. And Ron has recently joined us on the board. Yes. He's gonna talk a little bit about a book he wrote specifically for men in grief. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had, we've been in uh, our a corporation and a nonprofit now for a little over a year. And we've done some really amazing things that we're pretty excited about. And you have some amazing things coming up. Yes, so thank you so much for having us. Now Ron, you, um, had a son I did. that moved to heaven on you he did. and uh, it caused you to do some research. It did. I, uh, I consider myself, and I always say the word broad brushed, I know when I talk about men it's, it's kind of a broad brush topic where we're not all the same, but generally I was your typical male. I, I refused to grieve. Um, mm -hmm. It carried me well throughout the funeral service where I stood up and I was always strong and I thought that it would do me well afterwards as too, so I held my grief in. Uh, and then one day, I always say that Jonathan came to me in spirit, and he wanted me to carry out his legacy, and I had to go through the grief process first. Um, so I tried to do, uh, I tried to do a little uh, soul searching and go back through some books and couldn't find any for men. So I did my search, and after I did my search, I came up with some amazing discoveries about myself and about other men, and I documented those in a book. Tell me about those. Men have a tendency to be a little more, I think as we all know, a little more repressed about showing their, their emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about grief quite a bit. I always say that grief is a nice little word for a bundle of emotions because grief is so, so filled with uh, you know, sometimes anger, fear, um, sometimes uh, sorrow, loss, not sometimes, but, but all times. Right. Um, Men were pre-programmed, I mean, even before the, the, you know, the Stone Age days not to do that. And then we grow up as children being told, you know, uh, real men don't cry, uh, things like that. So we're, When real men do cry. They do, mm -hmm. but, but we're taught that. Yeah. Um, and it causes us to be, uh, I, I think they call it nature versus nurture. We're, we're taught in nature and nurture uh, not to show our emotions. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest difference, I think, between men and women. Men or women are a bit more empathetic and, and enjoy showing their emotions, or at least are allowed to show their emotions where we're not. Okay. One of the things that um, really touched me about your story was you were very angry. Talk to me about that. Because anger is a part of the grief. Oh, most definitely. Anger is, and, and especially, and again, I'll, I'll paint it from a man's point of view, but when a tragedy happens, a trauma happens, we want to find blame. We want a reason. We want to know why. Um, sometimes it actually gives into false guilt as well. We'll find guilt in ourselves because we just want something to be at fault for what happened. In my case, my child passed away in a hospital. So my initial reaction was to be angry at the hospital. Uh, I did many things to dissolve that myself and realize that was false anger. But um, in my mind at the time, it was, it was a good reason to be angry. And in fact, God turned that around for you and now you're, you've used that to start uh, helping other parents who are in the same position in the hospital, in right? In the same hospital. I, I attend workshops there to help other, bere or other bereaved parents. That's awesome. Thank so you. tell me more about how does the program help? Uh, yes, Cry For Me No More, we have several different services. We do some individual work if somebody contacts us that um, is not in the area where we are currently having a uh, program going on, then we can work with them remotely. But we also have workshops that we take around the nation, and it's an extremely transformational program. We've had parents that have touted us as being life-saving and, and really turning their life around. We try to teach our parents how to, and siblings, we mainly work with parents and siblings right now, but okay. we're starting to broaden out into, into more general grief. And we try to teach them how to 
how to move forward without feeling like they're leaving their loved one behind because that's a huge piece. A lot of people who have experienced a profound loss are, don't want to move forward because right. they don't want to lose that connection with their loved one mm -hmm. and they don't know how. And we teach them, you don't have to leave your loved one behind. Mm -hmm. We teach them how to bring them along with them, like Ron and I are doing, you know, to help live their legacy mm -hmm. and to keep them a big part of your life. And we give them the tools and uh, help them with touchstone exercises to refer back to, to help them move forward and continue that love exercise, you know, that love that the experience has always been there. Oh, because, yeah. you know, love doesn't die, love no. never dies. Uh -uh. And that's one thing that people forget, I think, sometimes in the grief process. And that they think they have to let go of that relationship and that love, but they don't, they don't have to. So mm -hmm. that's what our program's all about, okay. is teaching people how to live a fulfilling life once more without you know, without letting go of the trauma around the death as much as possible and trying to remember the other 364 days a year that those children or siblings lived in most cases or in utero or, mm -hmm. but remember the special times, not only the day they died because that, that one day is typically where we go back to again okay. and again on this journey. Tell me, uh, moving forward, what would be, if you don't move forward, what happens? Oh, a myriad of issues uh, can, can be caused from that. Uh, we've seen a lot of research that shows an increase in uh, drug and alcohol abuse. There's an increase in suicide and divorce rates. Uh, it just goes on and on. And you know, that stress from the trauma continues to build and build. And it's going to release sooner or later. I think you talk quite a bit about that in the book, don't you? I do. It's, it's emotions. I think uh, I almost equate emotions to being a, a sixth sense. I mean, I know people talk about clairvoyance and ESP, but I think, you know, our, our need to feel, our need to have emotions is just as strong as our need to, to drink water or to eat food. Um, without being able to express those and you keep those in the body, uh, you're really just damaging yourself inside. Uh, I equate it kind of to a, a stream running through the, the woods when a, a beaver dams it up. Mm -hmm. um, if your emotions aren't flowing out, then they back up behind that dam and they flood out the flora and the fauna behind it. Um, and then grief comes along or a major traumatic event and you've got that blockage down there. And men are famous for blocking it out anyway. Right. Uh, and normally we block it out right at the heart because we don't want people to see that we have a weakness or that we appear weak or what have you. So then you get something as, as traumatic as a loss come about and it's going to flood down there even faster. And it'll back up for a little while, but it's going to blow the dam. And when it does, just like you see in any flood, it's going to damage not only what's behind it, but what's out there as well, which is why we try to tell them, you've got to break that dam down. Mm -hmm. What about... Um there is a point, though, where you can go way too far with the emotions. Is that correct? Oh, most definitely. Uh, as like if you allow the, the emotions to control you. Right. Being uh, driven by your grief rather than you controlling it. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's very common, especially in the first parts of your grief journey, that that's going to happen from time to time. That's very normal, that you will have times when you emote or feel uh, in, intense anger. And I would say that as long as you're not hurting anyone or yourself, those feelings need to be dealt with. But to stay in there for long periods of time can, can really cause some emotional damage and along with physical damage because it's you know becoming well known that our emotions and stress uh, can cause illness in the physical body as well. Mm -hmm. So that is something that you really need to learn the proper tools to process those emotions correctly so they don't continue to cause collateral damage in your life. Right, and I think that's, I think, you had said something about uh, grief recovery mm -hmm. is really not the correct term because you really never recover from the fact that you miss the child or you miss the parent or you miss the husband. Whoever has gone on mm -hmm. before you, you miss them. Exactly. And so there is an empty place. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of turning that emptiness into purpose, like you, like, like you all have done. Exactly. You've, I, I, we were talking about how God sometimes takes those traumatic experiences in your life and opens a door, yes, just like does. He did for you, and directed your step. And now, 
I go back to the, you know, unless a kernel goes into the ground and dies, it doesn't bring forth fruit. And I see that in you, you both, how it has produced okay. and it continues to produce and yes. you're affecting other people. Tell people how they can find your organization, where your where your workshops are, Certainly. how to get a hold of your book, Ron. Right. Okay. Well, you can reach us at uh, www.cryformenomore.com, and I believe you'll have that information as well to give to the viewers. And all of our information is right there on our website. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter. Okay. So Good. feel free to, uh, I am the face behind our Facebook page. Yay. So if you get a message, that's for me. Okay. And uh, we hold workshops, like I said, nationally, but we have pulled back and we're going to focus on Georgia for a while because we have a, a strong uh, support base here and in, in, in the grief community in Georgia. Okay. And are in North Georgia in uh, the Southeast. And all that information is on our website. Okay. How about you, Ron? Where can they tell us the name of your book? Well, I named a book, I named the book after uh, what happened with me. And I think we were, before we came on here, I was telling you about it. Um, I didn't want to grieve. Um, and then one morning in the shower, about uh, six months after, mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan Spirit came to me and, and he said, you need to grieve. And I cried a lot in the mm -hmm. shower. And the title of my book is Sometimes I Cry in the Shower. <laughs> Uh, oh, the subtitle is A Grieving sweet. Father's Journey to Wholeness and Healing. And I do have a website. It's, it's grievingmen.com. All one awesome. word, grievingmen.com. And it's also a public forum, so anybody can come and share their stories and find other resources, such as a link to Cry For Me No More and some other organizations that we, we belong to. That's so awesome. Well, we just want to thank you both for being with us so much. And thank you for what you're doing to help people heal and go forward with purpose in their life and uh, it's just really wonderful. Thank you for and having us. And thank you so for much, watching today.